Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Six Figure Dog Business on PetLifeRadio.com. This is the show where we help you start or grow your pet-related business to a healthy six-figure per year or more income. I am your host, Ty Brown of SixFigureDogBusiness.com, and I am thrilled that you're here today because today I'm going to be sharing with you the formula that we've developed for selling millions and millions of dollars worth of dog training. It's a formula that I've now taught to dozens of other dog trainers. It's a step-by-step, take-you-by-the-hand process of here's how you can make high-ticket sales over and over and over. So stick right with me, and I'll be right back. Here is an alarming statistic. More than two-thirds of dogs and cats have oral health disease by the age of three, and one of the indicators is bad breath. Do your pets have a healthy mouth? Do you cringe when it's time for a kiss or a snuggle? Let's get to the cause. Harmful bacteria in their mouth. And bad breath is just the start. The bad bacteria cause tartar and oral disease, which can lead to serious overall health problems. It's critical to make sure your pet's oral health is the best it can be, as good dental health is key to optimizing their overall health. Now, good news. It's easy and affordable to improve their oral health with ProBiora Pet. Just one scoop of this dental care probiotic mixed into their food daily floods the mouth with positive bacteria, which crowds out the bad. This means better oral health and fresher breath. ProBiora Pet is an all-natural dental care probiotic. It's odor and taste-free, so your pets will still enjoy their chow. We want to keep your pets healthy. During National Pet Oral Health Month, our listeners can save 10%. Go to ProBiorapet.com and use PLR10 at checkout. That's ProBiorapet.com. Use PLR10 at checkout to save 10%. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. And apologies, I have not come out with a new episode for some time. I have been working pretty intently on sales training. I love sales training. (laughs) I kind of joke about it because uh, I grew up with sales training. My dad has been in sales training for decades since I was a kid. Um, And some kids grew up, you know, throwing the baseball around with their dad. And I did a little bit of that. We'd go fishing, play sports a little bit. He was my basketball coach one year, that type of thing. But I actually bonded with my dad more through things like sales training. I would read his sales books. I would read his sales magazines. I would go with him when he would uh, present. You know, I remember running a camcorder once. I was probably 12 years old or something, running a camcorder, filming him, you know, presenting something to a company. And so he's been in sales training you know, he's had his own sales training company for decades. And previous to that was in sales training positions within companies. And so I love sales training and I love sales training because I truly have come to understand on a deep level that sales is a process wherein sales as a (laughs) sales when it's done right is a process wherein people win, meaning you win, your customers win, your customers' dogs win, people that encounter your customers later on win, that everybody wins. I know that sales gets a bad rap oftentimes where people look at it as a win-lose type relationship or win-win-lose, you know, where somebody somebody loses. But to me, that's just manipulation. You know, that's not sales. And, and I guess maybe manipulation doesn't have to mean bad things either. But so that's that's unethical manipulation, I guess, is maybe the best way to put that. That really ethical, honorable sales is finding people that have legitimate problems, helping them understand the depth of those problems, and then providing a process wherein they can come to a, a realization of whether or not what you sell is the solution to their problem. And if everything aligns, what ends up happening is you solve problems. You solve problems for people and you make their life better. And I love that. I love that, you know, if you're a dog trainer, if you're a pet sitter, if you're a dog walker, if you're a dog groomer, if you're a veterinary office, I love that because it is so cool 
to be able to kind of be in charge of your own paycheck, be in charge of of your own future based off of a skill set that ultimately allows you to better serve people and make their lives better. And so anyways, just the synchronicity and the and and the wonderfulness of all those things coming together is something I really enjoy. So like I say, for the past six months, I've been working pretty intensely on, I've been writing a book, I've been working on sales processes. I recently was in Michigan, you know, presenting this program to a big uh, dog training company out there. I've been working with this uh, people outside of the dog industry and ultimately have just come to the realization that we are in an industry where people are not very good at sales. And I'm talking about dog trainers, pet sitters, dog walkers, dog groomers, that we're not very good at sales. Now, this episode is going to skew in the direction of dog training because dog training more than other things in the pet industry is a high ticket, more complex sale than perhaps what you might find with pet sitting or dog walking. But having said that, I would encourage you, no matter where you are in the dog industry, in the pet industry, to take these principles that I'm going to talk about because the principles are are transferable no matter the industry. Like I say, I've been teaching this in other industries outside of uh, outside of dogs in these past six months as I've been kind of away from making podcasts here. So, anyways, it's one of these things to where no matter your no matter your specialty or what your business is, you're going to find some something that you can take away from this and do really well with. So. What I want to share with you today is basically the process, the sales process, the journey that a customer must go through in order to end up deciding, yes, this is right for me or no, it's not. And deciding, no, this is not right for me is a very valid is a very valid decision. You're not going to sell everybody. You shouldn't sell everybody. If everybody you speak to, you end up selling, you might have a problem because it might speak to your ability to be very good at manipulation to get people, because the reality is not everyone that you're going to talk to is going to be a good match for you. And so that is part of the sales process is finding the people who aren't right for you just as much as it is finding the people who are right for you. Because ultimately we want to serve people that we are uniquely qualified to serve. There's a process, I often will call it even a roller coaster of emotions that we want to take somebody through that's going to allow us to most efficiently use the resources we have. And when I'm talking about the resources we have, I'm mostly referring to leads. Leads come in however they come in, right? Maybe you're advertising, maybe they come in through a website, maybe it's a referral, maybe it's, you know, you do, you were in featured in a newspaper, or radio, or whatever. Leads are gonna come in. And so my experience is as I've been digging deep into this with various companies, this is the lowest hanging fruit for how you can grow your business. Because as leads come in, most companies are not treating them very well. And as a result, most companies are not closing the amount of business that they could be closing if they were treating those leads a lot better. And so it's the lowest hanging fruit because from the leads that are already coming in, you know, let's say out of every 10 leads that come in, and first of all, most people don't even track this, but let's say 10 leads come in, some come in through email, some are phone calls, some are text messages, whatever. 10 people raise their hand and say, hey, I might be interested in what you have. If you're closing four of those into, into clients, you know, and that's your close rate, for example, going from four to five doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a 25% increase in business. Just getting a little bit better, you know, just going from four people to five people is a 25% increase. You might be saying, isn't that a 10% increase? Overall, that's a 10%, but one out of four is 25. So you you made a 25% jump in business, you know, in, in your efficacy. Somebody can correct me on my math there if you, if you feel like it. But what I'm getting at with this is just getting a little bit better suddenly starts bringing in, you know, makes you much more efficient, brings you much more money from the exact same number of people that you were going to in, interact with anyways. And so I say that it's the lowest hanging fruit because oftentimes people are out there looking for, oh, I need somebody to run my Google ads or my Facebook ads or my TikTok ads or whatever. You know, they're looking for someone to bring them more interested people, but the people that are already coming to them, they're not closing at a really good rate. And so now you're spending more money to get more people coming through your doors, phone, whatever, email, and you're still closing at a poor rate. It's anyways, long story short, the lowest hanging fruit is from the people that are already interacting with your business. If you can just close a higher percentage of them, it doesn't cost you any more in advertising. It doesn't cost you any more in time. It doesn't cost you any more in any sort of resource 
but now you're making extra money because those were people you were going to talk to anyways. Does that make sense? Like I say, this is the lowest hanging fruit. And uh, not only is it the lowest hanging fruit, it's the biggest driver of success of your business. Your ability to close a sale is the biggest driver of success in your business. Now, after that, of course, you've got to make people happy. You've got to have good administrative skills. You, you got to have all that stuff going on. But getting the sale is, you know, and getting someone to hand you money is how business occurs. And this is where I find it. I don't know if ironic is the right way. Maybe ironic in the old Alanis Morissette type way, but ironic in that this is the biggest driver of business. This is the lowest hanging fruit for growing a business. This is the most efficient way to improve a business. And yet it's what is almost universally ignored. And I've found this to be true, not just in the dog industry and in most industries, but it's universally ignored in the dog industry, dog training, pet sitting, dog walking, dog grooming, veterinary services. And what I'm talking about, of course, is sales training. Every dog trainer I know will save or put something on a credit card to fly across the country to go to a seminar to learn better leash handling skills, which I find to be fantastic. That's wonderful. You should do those things. Every dog trainer I know will spend money on some online course to improve a part of their dog training business, you know, to learn, you know, some sport healing technique or I don't know, you know what I mean, right? Every dog trainer I know is willing to spend money, time, effort, energy improving their ability to serve the customer, which is fantastic. That's great. You should do that. How many of them have spent time, money, and energy on sales training? And the reality is like, if <laughs> if you're in a room with a hundred dog trainers, you would probably get maybe one hand to raise. If you had any more than that, I can almost guarantee you that the only other hands coming up from that would be like, oh yeah, I used to work at this company and they put me through sales training. But most dog trainers of their own volition, most pet sitters, dog walkers, dog groomers, veterinary offices of their own volition have never and probably will never invest anything into sales training. Biggest mover of growth, lowest hanging fruit, most efficient way to grow a business, and people in this industry will invest nothing. I mean, if you were to find 100 dog trainers in a room and say, how many of you have Googled sales training just to find articles about how to get better at sales, my guess is that you would find very few people have actually done that. And so I say all this to say it's ludicrous, it's crazy. We're in an industry where you should be trying to get better at everything and not just sales training, not just dog training and, and your craft, but your administrative work, your HR and your hiring and, and firing and your all of these things that go into running a business. We're lacking in this industry, folks. And this is why you don't see businesses grow a lot. And you might be saying, I don't want a big business. That's fine. But we should be running our businesses like businesses. And I'm just as guilty of this as everybody else because it's taken me now, I'm, I don't know what I am, 15 years into owning this business and I'm still figuring out ways to improve our processes. And that leads me full circle to the process that I want to talk about today, which is the sales process. You should have a process to sales. There should be, whether it's you or people that you hire, there should be a certain set of things that you do in every sales conversation in order to make a sale. And you should be constantly trying to improve how you do these things. And I know that might sound silly. Well, of course, but again, nobody's doing it. And I can tell you from my own experience in growing this company, some of the biggest growth jumps that we've made have been nothing more than figuring out how to get even basic sales training to our, our people who are in charge of sales in our company. We've currently got roughly about 10 people that are involved in our sales process in our company. And as we have gotten on now weekly meetings for sales training and accountability and follow-up, our sales are just getting better and better and better. And so I want to encourage you to be thinking in those modes. But what I want to share with you today is our exact process. I mean, what I'm going to be talking about today is the exact type of things I would be talking about in one of these closed door meetings that I have with my own company on how we can improve our sales. And so I'm going to share with you the six things, the six components that need to be present in every dog training. I, well, I just said dog training, but again, this applies to anything, but in any sort of consult, any sort of, so this is a consult if you're a boarding kennel and you consult with people, you know, and their dog's got to pass a test or whatever. This is a consult for those who are going to walk the dog and you go through a consult, you know, to determine like what kind of dog walk. Anyways, so I know I just said dog training, but this applies everywhere. So six things that must occur in these sales consults. 
and I'm going to tell you right after the break. So <laughs> stick with me. I'll be right back. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> All right, we're back. Let me spend the second half here talking about the six components that need to go into every sales consult. And this goes for anything. And frankly, if you are a veterinary office, for that matter, you should consider basing a lot of your consults on what I'm about to talk about. Because your job, how many times are you as a veterinary office so frustrated because somebody can't find it in their budget to spend $1,500? And you happen to know, like, yeah, this person just came back from a vacation or they're going on a vacation or whatever, right? You, you know that they could find the $1,500, but they're not. And you just say, oh, well, they just don't care about their dog. Well, let me, let me put it out there for you that maybe they do care about their dog, but it's the presentation of how their life is going to improve that wasn't there. Let me say for a minute that maybe as a veterinary office, you could be better at messaging and that's going to help people do the right thing more often than not. This isn't just for getting more pet sitting, dog walking, dog training, and dog grooming. Even we're talking about potential life and death stuff when it comes to like veterinary services and things like that can use this exact same process. So let me get into it. Number one is just the intro. And frankly, this, when I'm doing sales training, this is where I spend the least amount of time because I don't think it needs a whole lot of time. You know, basically if you're in a, any sort of evaluation or consult or whatever, whatever the process might be, there should just be a little bit of small talk. Oh, what's your dog's name? Oh, he's so cute. Where'd you get him? Oh, you guys from here? You live in this area? Oh, what do you guys do for a living? I don't know, simple stuff like that. Um, but there is a immutable truth in that happens in sales that people like to purchase from others who they know, like, and trust. And so you can get a lot of like by just being a cool person that's genuinely interested. And this is a little key thing here, genuinely interested. I, for whatever reason, I think I've even talked about this on previous podcasts, but for whatever reason, I am genuinely interested in where people are from and what they do for a living. It interests me. Like when people are telling me like, oh, I'm just this boring accountant. Like I can find something. Inter- oh, you're an accountant. Tell me more. And and I get legitimately interested. I get really interested in where people are from because I've been lucky enough to have clients all over the country. I've been lucky enough to travel all over the country and, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 different countries. And so I love hearing where people are from. And it really is interesting to me. Some people couldn't care less where somebody is from and what they do for a living. And so maybe you don't talk about that. Maybe you're more interested in their kids. Maybe you're more interested in the car they drive. I don't know. Find a way to relate with them in kind of that intro period. So like I say, I don't need to spend too much time there. The second one, this is the big one. Well, there's a couple big ones. So (laughs) at the risk of sounding too hyperbolic, um, I don't want to keep saying this is the big one, but this is a big one. And this is discovery and development of pain. People are going to act to solve a problem if they feel that the pain is large enough to solve. And so, you know, let's say you sell dog training for $3,000. They need to feel that their pain is worth $3,000 or more in order for them to say, sure, I will work with you. If they feel like their pain is worth $300 and your solution is $3,000, they will not buy from you. And I say all this in a very literal way, and I don't want it to come across as manipulative that you've got to manipulate them into feeling worse about their problem because that's not what this is about. What you need to help them come to is an understanding of the depth of their problem and, and the challenge it is to fix it. Because most people are not intimately aware 
you know, and I'll use another dog training example here. How many times have you been in a dog training consult and someone is describing how their dog bit the mailman, attacked the neighbor's dog and ate their couch and they're saying things like, I just need basic obedience, right? It happens all the time. There is a huge disconnect. No, you don't need basic obedience, ma'am. Your dog needs an exorcism is what you really need. But, you know, there's a huge disconnect between most people's understanding of their problem and understanding of the solution. So we do a very poor job as stewards of their money, their time, their effort, and their dog if we are not helping them understand the depth of the problem that they're actually in. And so when salespeople, and this is across the board, but especially in the dog industry, when people who are trying to sell dog training or pet sitting or dog walking or veterinary services or whatever are routinely hearing things like, oh, that's too expensive, routinely hearing that. More often than not, they tend to blame the customer. Oh, they're not committed. They does that. And that's sometimes true. But more often what is true is that the salesperson has not done a good job of helping them develop and discover their pain. So this first, well, the first part is, of course, the intro. The second part here is discovery and development of pain. If you can do a really good job at this second part, you will hear much less resistance when it comes to price. You'll still get it, but you'll get much less resistance. You'll get much less people saying, wow, that's expensive. You'll get much less of that if you do a really good job of helping them discover and developing the pain that they have. Now, what I like to do is something that my dad taught me. He calls them fit questions, fact, issue, trouble, fact, issue, trouble. You don't necessarily need to go in this order, although sometimes you will. You don't need to stay in this order of doing fact, issue, trouble questions, and then that's it. You'll be bouncing around, but you need to, number one, establish the facts. These are the easy ones. How old is the dog? You, you know, what breed is he? You know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, stuff like that. Where do you guys live? You know, the facts. The issues are what's going on. Hey, he's pulling on the leash. And again, I'm using dog training here, but apply this to your whatever you're selling. He's pulling on the leash. He's barking at the neighbor dogs. Those are issues. And if all you do is bring out issues, you will be able to make sales. But if you can get to the trouble questions, this is the development of the pain. So FIT, fact issue trouble. If you can get to the trouble questions and really help people understand that the trouble that they are in, you will make many more sales. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that salespeople make is assuming that the person that they're speaking with, that their prospect, understands the reality of what the issues mean. So somebody says, my dog is pulling on the leash, and the dog trainer says, oh, well, obviously you want that leash pulling to stop, so I don't need to talk about that. But they don't understand the depth of what that means. So a trouble question, so here's the way that we always kind of like try to visualize this. Are you a fisherman or woman? I'm not. I'd like to be. I just bought a fly fishing rod and I'm hoping to start using it. But picture, even if you're not, picture yourself as a fisher person and you go out to the lake or the river, wherever you're going, and you start casting your line into one area. What are you trying to do? You're trying to get some bites and you cast in that area for a while. Nothing's happening. So you cast in another area. So you cast and nothing happens. So you cast in another area. That's what issue questions are. Issue questions start pointing us to where the problems are. The trouble questions are questions that give us the bites that are like, oh yeah, this is where the real action is happening. You know, so someone is saying, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, my dog barks at other dogs. That's the issue. Now, what's the trouble behind that? I don't know. We got to find out. And so questions might be like, oh, so do you do you have to walk him late at night so that you avoid other dogs? Yeah. Well, that's got to be a pain in the butt. What's it mean? Like, could you take him on a hike up in the mountains? Oh, no. If we encounter another dog, there's going to be a fight. And so uncovering the trouble that they're in is going to help you avoid price resistance and it's going to help them understand, oh, wow, look at all these things I'm missing out on or all this trouble that I have because of these issues. Now, they may have thought about these singularly over time, like, oh, I wish I could do this or, oh, I wish I could do that. But bringing them all to the front burner at one time is very valuable for helping them understand. So now, like I say, with the uh, discovery and development of pain, I call them pain clusters. And what I mean by a pain cluster is I try to get to one or two or three pain clusters. So a pain cluster might be, uh, you know, 
things that happen outdoors that ultimately they can't go on off-leash hikes because the dog won't come when called. It's a pain in the butt to go on leash walks because the dog pulls and, and that's a cluster. I can talk about that and I can do trouble questions. And then another cluster might be that, you know, at home he's barks his head off when the doorbell rings, he barks at birds through the window and he's got all these impulse control problems at home. And a third pain cluster might be that he's also chewing on my shoes and he's marking the bed and he's marking, he's marking the couch and there's another pain cluster, right? And so, so I try to put things into pain clusters because ultimately what we're trying to do here is in a moment, we're going to be talking about our hero program. And, I, and I'll explain why I call it that. But our hero program, we're going to be talking about that in a minute. But I'm going to explain my hero program. And in order for us to have a really true hero, we need to have a villain. And so we want like a name and a face on this. Oh, so it sounds like going, you know, going in the outdoors, you guys are outdoorsy people and you can't do it as much as you'd like because of A, B, C, and D. Boom, there's a villain. And we can strike down that villain with our hero program here in a second. We're going to tell you just how we can do that, blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, our life isn't as good as it could be because he freaks out when the doorbell rings and he's barking at birds all day long. And, you know, he's barking at anytime the Amazon guy drops stuff off and we put a name and a face on it. Boom, we've got a villain. Right. And so, so in any case, I call them pain clusters and I like to develop them, summarize them. Okay. So it sounds like this is your problem and you wish it would be different. Okay. Cool. Let's talk about the next issues. It sounds like this is your issue and, and you wish it was different for this. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Now, this is the point where most people want to jump into telling about their program and you should, but wait, don't do it until you do this transitional piece. And what the transitional piece is, is it's two things. One of them might have already come out by now. One of those is I want to determine what have they done previously. Because when I'm going to, for those of you that have been in this business any period of time, here in a moment, we're going to tell them about our program and the price. And I know that many of you have heard, oh, we've been trying all that. I'm not sure your program's for us. We've, and then you're like, what the heck are you talking about? You haven't done anything of what I've been talking about. What makes you, why would you say that? That's not true. And so, because they don't understand, you know, the differences. And so one of the best ways to do that is to get them to identify what they've done. And then later when I'm talking about our program, I can explain how it's different. But sometimes during the process of discovery and development, we'll uncover it, you know, meaning, you know, they'll have said, hey, I was doing this and I went to another trainer and they had me do this. Or, you know, I, I saw some YouTube videos and I tried this. Or my coworker said I should try this. So sometimes they'll identify it, in which case I'll summarize that here. Meaning, all right, so it sounds like you've got such and such a problem and this problem and this problem and this problem. And it sounds like you've tried this, this and this and it hasn't worked. Is that right? But anyways, they need to admit where their failure has come from. My failure has come from trying another trainer that did techniques that, you know, whatever, or doing YouTube videos. You know, this is the source of my failure because I need to explain to them how they can't fail with my program. And if it sounds the same in their mind, which I know it's not the same, but if it sounds the same in their mind, it's going to be a tough sell to help them understand why they should now give me thousands of dollars. And so the transitional piece is, you know, sometimes I'll just ask the question outright. So, let you know, it sounds like you got these, you know, problems A, B, C, and D. Let me ask you, you seem like a good dog owner. I'm sure you haven't been sitting on your thumbs for a year doing nothing. What have you tried that hasn't worked? And I want to get that out there. And then the second transitional piece before I go into the hero program is I want to get a commitment that they're willing to change. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal. You need people committing to change. And this isn't some manipulation tactic, but so many people have no commitment that they're going to actually do anything. And one of the big issues that dog trainers run into, and I know this happens in other dog industries, is, oh, my clients don't put in the work. My clients this, my clients that. Well, did you ever commit them to the work? Not just once, but throughout the process. Most dog trainers don't. And so this is a first start that then we want to carry through the entire process. And this is one way that you can get clients that are way better clients. The exact same people can be a great client or an awful client, depending on you. And I know dog trainers do not like to hear that because they love to blame their clients and say, oh, my clients just don't want to work. My clients this, my clients that. And it's much harder to say, what can I do to change how my clients are perceiving what I'm doing? Nevertheless, we want to get a commitment here and we want to carry that commitment throughout the rest of the sales process and throughout the rest of the training process. And so getting that commitment could be as easy as asking for it and saying, okay, I want to tell you about our program, but let me just ask you, you've got you know problems A, B, C, and D, you've tried YouTube videos and another trainer, so let me ask you, are you willing to commit to something else? I'm not saying you have to commit to mine, I want to tell you about my program first, but are you willing to commit to a new program and put yourself wholly in there? 
you know, your whole self and, and give this a go. And I want to hear them say yes. And if, because if they're like, no, <laughs> then I'm not going to waste my time. Forget it. You know, we're, we're done. But I want to hear them say yes. And I want to carry that through the whole way. So anyways, so that's one way is this a direct. Another way is an assumptive way, you know, to where there's, okay, so it sounds like you've got problems A, B, C, and D. It sounds like you've tried this. To me, it sounds like you're the type of dog owner that says, all right, I've tried all these things. They haven't worked. I just need to find a professional that can help me work through this. And I'm ready to put in the time. I'm ready to put in the effort. I just need to do this right. Is that you? And then, you know, people say yes. You know, so you can do an assumptive way. Or the third way that I'll sometimes do is a challenge type way. And the challenge way is if I feel like there might be a lack of commitment, you know, that the person doesn't seem like somebody and I need them to tell me. And it might be something like, look, you know, so it sounds like you've got these problems. You've been dealing with them for a year and a half. Sounds like you've tried this, this, and this. Let me just ask you this. Like some people have these issues and they just keep dealing with them. You know, they'll deal with them for the next 10 years. They wish the problem was different, but they know they're not going to change anything. Um, and so they just learn ways to deal with it. Let me just ask, you know, I'll be bold. Is this you? Are you someone that's just going to deal with this? Or are you finally ready to get over this problem? Boom, you pause, you give that empathy. And anyways, those are the three ways that we will ask for commitment. But we do not move forward under penalty of death. You do not, at my company, you do not move forward with the sale until you have that commitment that we're going to do something different. And that's when we jump into the hero program. And I recognize this is going a little bit long. And so let me go through these, uh, the last three here. The hero program, we call it the hero program because the hero saves the day. And what else is a characteristic of a hero? A hero can't fail. Like when you watch Marvel movies or when you watch DC movies, like the hero stumbles, the hero falls, the hero trips, but ultimately he can't fail. And this is a trope. This is a uh, theme that has been woven in and out of everything since the dawn of humanity. This theme of, you know, things were tough. We had this problem, but then we discovered this thing and da -da -da -da. now our problems are solved. That's the power of the hero program. And we want to continue that conversation that people are already from the Rocky movie that they saw when they were five years old to the Marvel movie that they saw last week on, in the big screen. This hero's journey is something that they're familiar with. And it's one of the best things that helps inspire change, you know, when people see this hero's journey. So your hero program, the way you describe your program should be that. And frankly, when I do sales training, this takes forever to get into. So I was never going to, you know, this is far more than a podcast can hold. But when I'm doing sales training, what I help people understand is the best thing you can do here to describe your program is not to say, all right, you're going to get three sessions and this and this and this. But instead, the best way to solve your, the best way to present your program is to find three things that are different and highlight those things and use those things to show how they cannot fail. And so oftentimes even saying it just like that, you know, like traditional dog training often will fail because of A. And so what we've done in our program is, is we, you know, we do this thing that, you know, that is different than A. And here's how it works. You get these amount of sessions and we do this, this, and that, whatever. And then people often fail through B. And then people often fail through C. And so you've got three ways that people will fail. Uh, because people know that there's a chance that they're going to fail and we need to help them understand we've thought of all the ways that you could fail and we've solved them for you. Now, what I try to do whenever possible is I try to do reasons that they have failed in the past, reasons that they might fail if they worked with us, like what might be going through their mind and reasons why they might fail in the future. And I help them see how our program can can help solve that. So, hey, you might have failed in the past because you're watching YouTube videos and the YouTube videos might have been great, but you didn't have anybody helping walk you through the process of how to do it and blah, blah, blah. So we've solved that with this hands-on slash whatever approach. And people sometimes fail with dog trainers because they go to the class, but then they just don't do the homework. Now, we've solved that by doing this. And then people sometimes fail in the future because the dog gets trained, but then they can't keep it trained. And we've solved it with this. Whatever the case might be, I try to figure out why the conversation going on in their mind, why I have failed thus far and how this program solves that, how I could fail if I sign up with these guys and how this program solves that, and how I might fail in the future if I do go through this program and how these guys have solved that. And if you can do those three things, this is powerful. And you present your hero program in such a way. 
Now, step number five. So we've got the intro. We've got discovery and development of pain. We've got the transitional piece. We've got the hero program. And number five is stack and quote. So stack and quote is a very simple process of telling them, you know, like, all right, so let me tell you, as you're going through the hero program, you're telling them, well, it's got these sessions. It's got this online component. It's got these group sessions. It's got whatever, right? You know, whatever comes in it. You don't want to give your price right after you do that. What you want to do is you want to stack everything up again because you want to summarize so that they feel like they're getting this huge thing. So to summarize, you're going to get these private sessions. You're going to get this online resource. You're going to get these um, workbooks that are going to help you do this. You're going to get these group sessions that are going to help you do that. And the price is blank, whatever your price is. So you never want to go through like a five-minute pitch where it's like, well, we're, you know, we're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. You're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. You're going to do this blah, blah, for five minutes, and then you give a price. What you want to do is do that five-minute pitch Take one minute, stack it all back up, everything that comes in the program, and then give a price. It psychologically helps them understand the benefits of the program better. And then finally, now for a lot of sales, this is where the sales process, well, doesn't end, but this is where it transitions into a sale. And they're like, yep, let's do it. Or number six is resolve concerns and ask again. So resolving concerns, there's a million ways to do it, but one of the best ways to do it just for a simple like skill set that anybody can develop is feel, felt, found. Feel, felt, found might be something you're already familiar with. If you're not, it's a very simple concept of someone saying, oh, you know, let's say you get to the end and someone's like, oh, this sounds great. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to have the time to do it. I'm busy. You know, I work 50 hours a week. Feel felt found would be like, no, I, I understand why you feel that way. Like that, yeah, you're busy. You're a busy person. In other words, you, you acknowledge. And in fact, we've got a lot of clients that have felt the same way. You know, they felt like, oh, because I'm this busy, I'm not going to be able to do the amount of work it's going to take to train my dog. But what they found is that because our system is unique and it's different, it actually takes less time than just about any other dog training program out there. We have something that we call integration training that you integrate the training into your everyday life and it actually doesn't take a whole lot of time. It takes effort. I don't want to lie to you, but like it doesn't take as much time as you might think. And that's what other people have found. So anyways, instead of like combating what they say with like, no, you're wrong and here's why, you do feel felt found. I acknowledge that you feel that way. Other people have felt the same way and here's what they found. And so you use kind of social proof to help them understand that like, yeah, other people have been in the exact same situation as you. So, and then you just ask again. So what do you think? Should we get this guy signed up? So let me just recap. And I know I've gone long. I usually keep these to about 30, 35 minutes and we've gone long on this one. But there's six components of any sales process. The intro, the discovery and development of pain, having a transitional piece, your hero program, stack and quote, and resolve concerns and ask again. And now, typically they go in that order, although sometimes they can go a little bit out of order, uh, but typically they're gonna go in that order. And if you can keep things in that order and develop each one of those components, you will improve your conversion rates, you will. And not only will you improve your conversion rates, you'll improve your paycheck, you'll improve the lives of many other dog owners, everything gets better when you can improve this sales process. So I encourage you to build a process that's unique to your company. Now, I think it needs to have these six components. If you feel, if you find something better, I say go for it. But find a process that you can go through, that you can train on, and that as you grow, that you can introduce other people into doing. So thank you for listening to this episode. I encourage you to go over to PetLifeRadio.com, hit up Six Figure Dog Business, and listen to all the episodes that I've got because they're all pretty darn awesome. And while you're there, listen to the other episodes on PetLifeRadio.com. They have a lot of really cool shows with a lot of variety on lots of pet stuff. So I recommend you listen to those. And then head over to SixFigureDogBusiness.com to see what I'm up to. Thanks a bunch. Talk to you soon. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.